Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are in the world. I am Sophie Dupuis from ISN headquarters, and I'm very pleased to welcome you to this webinar focused on our ISN Education Ambassador program. Today, we have three panelists, Vivek Jha from India, who is the chair of the Education Ambassador program and will provide you with a full description and overview of the program. Then we will have Vanessa Bijol from the USA. She, she will bring her experience as an education ambassador. And finally, Mar Mara Rodriguez, who's based in Brussels in the ISN office. She's the coordinator of the program and she will take you through the practicalities of how to apply to the program. Before I give the floor to Vivek, I'd like to remind the audience of a couple of house rules. You're all on mute, and this is to avoid any unpleasant background noise, but of course you will be able to ask questions, and you can do this through the question box of your webinar panel. So don't hesitate to submit any question you may have. I will then relay those questions at the end of the presentations to the panel. This webinar will also be recorded. You will be able to watch it again and or share it with your colleagues should you wish to do so. So now, without any further delay, uh, I would like to invite Vivek to present the objectives and the aim of the Education Ambassador Program. Thank you, Sophie. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I am Vivek Jha. I am the chair of the ISN Education Ambassadors Program, and I'm very pleased to be participating in this webinar with all of you. We are doing this for the very first time, so this is really exciting for all the staff members of the ISN, as well as uh, some of us who have been associated with the program for a long time, and we will have the exciting opportunity to hear from uh, Dr. Vanessa Bijol as well. So this slide shows you the agenda of this particular webinar. So we will talk about the Education Ambassador Program and really the purpose will be illustrated by a story of success that will be presented by Dr. Vanessa Bijol, as I said. And then I will hand over to the ISN headquarters staff members who will take you through the various steps on how to prepare successful applications, how to use the Education Ambassador Applications website, and we will end with a Q&A session. So let's start with the first topic. What is the ISN Education Ambassadors Program? So the Education Ambassador Program aims at filling the gaps in the practice of nephrology in the most disadvantaged regions of the world by helping development of skill set that allows setting up or improving a specific service. This program offers the ISN members a hands-on, high-quality training from international experts. Whether you are a physician or a nurse or a technician, you can receive the guidance that you need to develop new services to set up care, research, or screening programs. So you can already see the difference between this program and the ISN fellowship program in which a fellow goes from an emerging center to a so-called developed world center to learn something and then comes back to start that facility to his or her home center. On the other hand, the education ambassador program actually invites an ambassador to come and work and help the entire department set up a new program. So this is a main difference. The other main difference with the fellowship program is that for the education ambassador programs, applications are accepted all year long and you have the web URL here and the web URL will be available to you in your emails as well. So here are a few examples of the kind of services that the education ambassador program helps set up in different centers that, that wish to set up these programs. So they have included in the past pediatric nephrology services, uh, nephropathology services, intervention nephrology, improvement in the care of patients with dialysis, setting up of transplantation service. So, and this is, a, this is also a story that, that we can tell with some pride that the ISN Education Ambassador Program has helped set up transplant services in some uh, developing world centers, and some of them are doing very well now. 
and in the end last but not the least uh, the education ambassador program uh, has also helped set up palliative care services it's important to mention here that in the education ambassador program we encourage not just one visit by the ambassador but also to follow up visits so as to maintain sustainability of these clinical development projects. If an ambassador has come and helped set up, start something, then it is a good idea for the ambassador to perhaps come back after a few months or maybe even a couple of years to perhaps take the service to the next level and to make sure that whatever has been established is now sustainable. So, you can ask the question, what is in the Education Ambassador Program for the host institutions? As I said before, you get the opportunity to host an expert and get specific hands-on training. The host institution gets to develop a new set of skills or services. It is better able to meet the need of their patients and their families. And of course, the host institution benefits from the flexible and multiple solutions to your very specific educational requirements, which may be different from any other institution. And in the end, uh, we think that this program will help uh, develop a working nephrology unit, which will help your institution deal with uh, government schemes and financial grant schemes, etc. So the next question always is, all right, this sounds interesting. Am I eligible or not? So this program is open to any institution in low and middle income countries, provided that the applicant has an active full ISN membership and the applicant, of course, if he or she has a full ISN membership, they would have already declared their adherence to the declaration of Istanbul, which is also a requirement. Let me take this opportunity to make a specific mention that the ISN membership is free for all applicants from low-income countries as defined by the World Bank classification. So world, we know that the World Bank classifies country into, countries into low-income, low-middle income, upper-middle income, and high-income countries. So for low, if you live in a low-income country, you can become a member of the ISN completely free of charge. If you live in a low middle income country, and please also refer to the World Bank classification list, this list is also available on the ISN website. You can avail of a joint group membership so that a group of five people can join the ISN as, as full members at the cost of a single membership. Now, it's also important to mention that if you are interested in uh, applying for an ambassador, you can choose your own ambassador who will meet your specific needs. However, if you want, our staff and our leaders can help you find an appropriate ambassador as well. So what about an eligible ambassador? Again, then eligible ambassador needs to be an ISN member. Is go, goes without saying that the expert should be, you know, a real expert uh, in a defined area of nephrology with various peer-reviewed publications, so that uh, the the applicant's expertise can be really judged by the judging panel of the Education Ambassador Program Committee. Typically, the Education Ambassadors are active faculty members with appointments at accredited institutions, and of course. As ISN members, they also adhere to the Declaration of Istanbul. Now, please note that the ambassadors can be physicians, but they can also be nurses and technicians. Typically, in the first visit, uh, the leader is a nephrologist or a nephropathologist uh, who brings with him or her a technician or a nurse in order to set up a service. However, during a follow-up visit, it might be okay just for the nurse or for the technician to come and do the follow-up. So what is the funding mechanism? So the ISN encourages the host institutions to actually have some stake in the development of these services. So whereas the ISN reimburses an economy class airfare or train travel, it also reimburses any reasonable transfers 
uh, like from airport to wherever the ambassador is staying, auto mileages and normal visa fees, etc. But we do expect that the host institution will actually take care of the ambassador by providing for uh, appropriate accommodation, uh, local transportation, and daily meal service. Uh, once the expert or ambassador returns home, uh, they are uh, required to submit online the reimbursement request. And this reimbursement request usually needs to be accompanied with scanned copies of tickets and receipts for all expenses that need to be reimbursed, which is a standard policy in any reimbursement uh, process. It is worth pointing out that the ISN runs this education ambassador programs in collaboration with a number of partners, which include from left to right, the Asia Pacific Society of Nephrology, the Australia and New Zealand Society of Nephrology, the Indian Society of Nephrology, and the SLAN, which is the Latin American Society of Nephrology. Typically, these societies and the International Society of Nephrology split the cost 50-50, uh, for any ambassador program which is applicable to that specific region. Now, after the training, both the host center and the education ambassador are expected to submit a report within 30 days. This report submission is of extreme importance for us, and we really look forward to getting these reports, and it will be certainly taken into account when considering possible future applications, because one uh, host education ambassador program center might wish to apply for subsequent applications as well. And again, the reports are submitted online. Now, I will request uh, Sophie to uh, hand over the presenter's uh, position to Vanessa Bijal so that she can actually go ahead and discuss the, uh, the story of a success. So can you do that while I uh, introduce Vanessa? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, my screen is now shared. Yeah. All right. Right. Can see Thanks, Vanessa. So let me take this opportunity to introduce to you uh, Dr. Vanessa Bijal, who is the chief of renal pathology at, uh, at, at the Northwell Health an associate professor of pathology at Hofstra University of School of Medicine in New York. Uh, prior to coming over to New York, she was a renal pathologist for several years. Uh, she trained at the Brigham's and Women's Hospital and Howard Medical School in Boston, and then was a staff pathologist. She also completed a fellowship in medical education in the, at the Academy of Harvard Medical School. She has, you, many of you might know that she has been a co-chair of the very successful ISN Clinical Nephropathology Certificate Program since 2014. And she is also a member of the ISN uh, Academy Education Working Group. Dr. Bajol has participated as an education ambassador in several projects, including setting up programs in Nigeria, Nepal, Rwanda, and Georgia. Her main professional interests include glomerular diseases, medical education, and global renal pathology education and practice. And we are extremely pleased that, that Dr. Bijal uh, has agreed to share with us uh, a story of the success of an edu ISN Education Ambassador Program. So over to you, Vanessa. Thank you so much, Vivek. And uh, hello, everyone. Uh, as uh, Dr. Vivek said, uh, you may know me through the CNC program, but I'm also a very proud educational ambassador. I think this is a fantastic program. And I just wanted to share some of uh, my experience. Um, as uh, said, you know, I did uh, engage in several trips, but I will share a couple uh, with you, um, mainly because they're so different. And I kind of like thought about this. I think, um, first of all, EAP can be used, uh, as uh, Dr. Vivek was saying, uh, for several different purposes. And when it comes to renal pathology, I tend to think of it as a program where you can either improve the existing service that needs to become uh, cleaner and more functional in some places, or you uh, get to deal with a place where there is no existent uh, pathology service and you uh, need to build it from the scratch. As you can imagine, this really requires uh, two very different approaches. So I'll show you uh, examples of both. 
and I will start with uh, my last trip to Georgia. This is a, a, a view of uh, uh, their uh, beautiful city of uh, Tbilisi in Georgia. Uh, as you can tell, you know, a lot of modern architecture intermingled with some of the older one. It's a really, really beautiful country. Um, and uh, not only that, they also have a really beautiful script, as you can see over here. I can't read it, but it's really pretty to look at. But this is a picture really of their um, uh, brochure that they created for uh, this event. So they took uh, our visit very, very seriously, and they really wanted to improve uh, the existent um, renal pathology service. Uh, I would say you know, the product that they had was very, very difficult to work with uh, prior to our visit. And I really think that we managed to uh, get to a point that um, I would call it really a success story. So uh, I'll tell you a little bit what we did there. Um, first of all, um, we did a complete site evaluation of their um, light microscopy, immunofluorescence and electron microscopy procedures. Uh, then um, I would say also the nephrologists took advantage of our uh, presence there. Um, so they uh, really had a number of uh, biopsies at the time when we visited so that we could actually uh, evaluate them in real time. Um, and we also uh, conducted a workshop for three days with lectures and case dis discussions. And uh, that was really uh, very, very uh, valuable, I think, for all of us. So we got to know each other much better through, through that experience. Uh, this was my partner in crime. Uh, as mentioned, um, we can travel with um, um, uh, technicians. And this is uh, Robert Santoyani, who uh, is really superb uh, EM and IF uh, technologist. He's currently retired, but uh, we used to work together at Emory University in Atlanta. And uh, he also used to be a supervisor of a histology lab there for years. So he's very, very familiar with equipment, procedures, and so on. So when we um, got there, we reviewed um, all the current state of their histology, immunofluorescence, electron microscopy. Um, so we looked through their equipment, workflow, procedure manuals, all the technical aspects of, of specimen processing. And we wrote a you know, several page um, report of that evaluation together with recommendations for improvement. And then we kind of like really looked for um, uh, deficiencies that we could tackle while there, but also we made a plan for them, you know, like how to improve on certain other things uh, over time, because obviously, you know, certain things uh, will take uh, longer to, to fix than just, you know, during our visit. Um, we did also hands-on training in biopsy handling, frozen section technique, IF, uh, EM processing, and so on. And uh, we reviewed their uh, uh, cases as, as they were actually um, uh, coming through. Uh, so we helped with interpretation of uh, light microscopy, immunofluorescence, and EM material as we were there. So um, uh, this is Robert with, uh, this is George Pataraya, a, a local EM specialist there, uh, and Miranda Tsilosani, uh, she's a renal pathologist. Um, that uh, we are hoping that she will also come to the United States uh, this summer to uh, improve on her skills through the fellowship program, which is kind of like also an example how uh, this ISN program, EAP, can be actually um, uh, joined with other uh, efforts of the ISN. And I think it's really important to use uh, uh, some of the other uh, modalities that ISN offers to, to kind of like really uh, get the most out of the, this effort. Um, so we were looking into their uh, electron microscopy equipment. This is their electron microscope, as you can see, uh, an old piece of equipment. But, you know, they're, they're still uh, getting their stuff done there, and uh, they do have electron uh, microscopy uh, procedure, which I have to say I think we managed to uh, improve to, to a, a readable uh, uh, state uh, currently. Uh, so going back to this slide, uh, I think, you know, this is really important. It's not just to um, 
go there and see what, what is going on. I think it's really important to have a plan, uh, really evaluate what is uh, there um, uh, already present and figure out how to actually uh, improve um, deficiencies and so on, attack the deficiencies and, and uh, work on them. Uh, so that's exactly what we did. We also, uh, as I said, conducted this workshop. Um, Robert also gave a lecture on specimen handling, introduction to IF and EM, which I think is very, um, uh, it was a very thorough lecture and I also think very helpful to technicians, but also to pathologists and even to nephrologists, I think it's important to know what exactly it requires to, to uh, do, you know, like with these techniques. So um, then I gave some basic lectures, some more specific lectures on different topics. And uh, I would say case discussions were really awesome because um, the group of nephrologists there is very motivated and they're excellent actually. Uh, and uh, we had really, really uh, good sessions uh, during this workshop. Uh, so this is a picture before uh, Robert's lecture. And I would say within an hour, this doubled and by the end of the, the workshop, the, the number of people tripled. Uh, but uh, you have Robert here and myself and uh, Miranda Tsilosani and some nephrologists and pathologists. It was really a, a very uh, good meeting, I would say. Um, this is us at the microscope reviewing some of their cases. Uh, I would say um, one thing that you don't see here is that I have an attachment on this microscope and I'll show you that in a second, but I just want to introduce Dr. Irma uh, Chokonalidze, which I'm sure I totally mispronounced, but she's a chair of NIS and Russia Regional Board for the ISN and she's an amazing nephrologist uh, surrounded by a group of and team of uh, uh, also very uh, wonderful uh, young nephrologists that, uh, you know, train all over the place and uh, they're extremely good and uh, very motivated to have also a good renal pathology service. So again, you know, Miranda may be uh, coming through the ISM fellowship to uh, increase expertise in her uh, field. And uh, I think it's, it's work in progress. And again, you know, like it can be done just through one visit, but I think it's, it's important to uh, start doing these things and to connect with people and so on. So let me get back to this attachment. It's like a, a little thing that can uh, do a lot. So uh, one thing that I brought there was this attachment to the uh, microscope where you can put your iPhone uh, to the microscope and take images of, um, you know, your light microscopy and immunofluorescence. So uh, when Miranda has a tough case, you know, she would take pictures. Uh, this is, you know, how it would look like. Uh, I mean, it's not perfect, but, you know, you, you get a good sense as to what the biopsy is showing. Uh, this is uh, their current immunofluorescence negative stain. And I think it's important to see that, that, you know, you, you have a wonderful, actually, morphology and we were able to uh, kind of like get a really good technique um, in immunofluorescence. So now you can actually interpret it as positive or negative. So that was uh, that, and I, I think it was a very successful visit. This is their um, uh, hachapuri. This is a bread with cheese that we ate a lot during our visit there, and it's their traditional meal. Uh, but uh, um, uh, I, I just warn you, if you go there, it's highly addictive, so be careful with it. Um, in any event, I, I thought this was a great visit in which we uh, managed to uh, really uh, improve the current uh, service and, and make it really um, functional at, at this point. And I'll just uh, also tell you a story of our uh, project in Rwanda. Uh, this was very, very different uh, because there was no existing renal biopsy program. Uh, so you had to start from uh, scratch practic practically to develop the renal biopsy program through nephrology and radiology um, so that you can get the material. Uh, then uh, to develop renal pathology lab, uh, light and uh, immunofluorescence service. They did have light microscopy going, uh, but you know, for uh, uh, renal biopsies, it's important that you have a really good technique, that the sections are thin and 
perfect and that you also use special stains, uh, at least PAS and trichrome, um, if not uh, others. Um, and then the other thing is really to make it uh, sustainable, you have to kind of like really develop local renal pathology expertise. And I'll, I'll tell you what we did uh, with regards to that. But really uh, the champion of this pro project, I would say is Marla McKnight. She's from Canada, from University of um, uh, British Columbia in Vancouver. And she's also associated with uh, uh, Harvard Medical School and uh, she's a faculty also at um, um, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital, and that's how we met. She came to me to ask me to be part of this uh, project. And uh, this is her colleague, uh, Patrick Voss, uh, who is a radiologist from um, uh, Vancouver, and he visited there. Uh, this is Joseph, uh, Dr. Joseph from uh, Kigali, so local nephrologist who uh, was uh, really the most important person that we uh, worked with uh, while there. So um, again, you know, like to get to even renal pathology, you have to start from here. Um, I went there with uh, Bernie Collins, who is really an exceptional um, technologist uh, from Mass General in Boston. And he uh, really, you, you can tell actually, he's playing here with that uh, iPhone um, attachment to the uh, microscope, but uh, he helped really develop the technique there. This is a technician. Uh, of course, you know, you have to count on presence of equipment there. So this is a cryostat that they had there. Uh, fortunately, uh, it's used in pathology for different purposes. Uh, so we were able to also, um, you know, use it there for our purpose for immunofluorescence. And uh, Bernie brought some of the uh, reagents with him, um, and uh, he taught uh, uh, local staff how to uh, do sections. This is actually a bunch of residents, uh, pathology residents, uh, you know, practicing frozen sections, uh, and uh, other lab um, uh, personnel there that uh, worked on immunofluorescence technique. So Bernie was really instrumental in, in um, making this happen there. So the IF was actually able to uh, really um, be started from scratch and, and they have it functional there. But again, you know, like you can just come there and make it happen and leave. Uh, what we also really wanted to have is uh, a person who can take over and really make sure that this will be sustainable. So Thierry Zavadi is uh, an amazing uh, young pathologist who trained in Kenya, but he's R Rwandan. And then uh, we brought him to Brigham and Women's for a year. He trained there in renal pathology and he went back home uh, to uh, Kigali and that's where he's practicing now. And really, uh, uh, we are trying to really uh, make this a very sustainable uh, project there. But again, you know, like this is a, a team approach and uh, Marla McKnight was uh, an amazing uh, person there who really pulled everything together. She came there for, through the EAP uh, multiple times and I've been there twice. Uh, and again, you know, like this is another success story, uh, I would say, uh, but as you can tell, you know, this required much bigger approach. I know this is out of focus, but this is my last image, uh, very dear to me because we're all uh, having a great time. These are pathology residents, Marla McKnight and myself, and one of the professors in pathology uh, in Kigali. And, uh, you know, we also did a workshop there with a number of lectures. Um, and uh, uh, that was uh, also, I think, very uh, good for the, the local uh, pathology and nephrology uh, trainees. Uh, so that is, you know, like I'm hoping that I painted a little bit of a picture of uh, what one can do through the EAP program. Um, I, I think it's really important to have a plan uh, and uh, to kind of, uh, when it comes to pathology, I think it's very useful to come with technicians uh, because otherwise, you know, like um, uh, I think it's it's much lower impact that, you know, of a change that you can do uh, because it's very often that, uh, you know, techniques are problematic or you have to start the program and without the technical support, you can't really uh, do that. So I'll leave it at that and uh, I, I'm looking forward to any questions uh, people may have and I will um, give my um, 
mic back to uh, Sophie if she's on. Yeah, so Mara will actually, thank you very much, Vanessa, for uh, those telling stories and uh, and showing us how dedicated you are to helping other organizations. That's really great. So now Mara will actually be much um, uh, really practical and she will provide you with a few tips on how to uh, submit a successful application to the program. So Mara, it's on you. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Vanessa. Thank you, Vivek. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, so, how to prepare a successful application and how to make it uh, impactful. Uh, so, that's what we are going to see if this changes. <laughs> oh, okay, so do's and don'ts. Let's talk a bit about that. Uh, okay, do's. So, what we should always do. Um, as you may be aware, um, it, it, it takes time for us to really uh, analyze and review the applications. So this is sensitive. So please uh, bear in mind that you should not wait until the last moment to, uh, to send your applications. At least do it three months before the, the date of your training, if possible, of course. So um, we want to really provide our best support. Um, don't um, be too... Uh, um, or have, have your description as detailed as possible. So describe um, uh, in detail the purpose of the training, uh, the expected impact and the measurable outcomes because that's really important for us to, to analyze. Uh, with the new workflow and forms that we have in place in our website that we will see in a bit, um, you will be asked to provide specific and important information. So be as detailed and complete as possible when answering to them. Uh, we will ask for numbers, subjectives, so please uh, be very, very clear. Um, also provide a clear training plan, and you should um, develop this jointly with the expert or the ambassador. Um, so this is essential. Remember that the focus is hands-on training on clinical development. So um, together with the host, uh, you should make this very, very clear. Of course, again, we can always help you. We're always here to, to support. Um, indicate the uh, duration of the visit, one, two, four weeks, so minimum one week. Uh, the visit must be sustainable and fruitful. Um, selecting a precise and clear budget, so uh, submit a clear budget proposal. Uh, as Vivek has, has mentioned before um, regarding the funding mechanism, um, we, the ISM reimburses the, the experts for travel, transfer, visa, etc. but the host is expected to provide hospitality. So be clear about this and also you are always welcome to uh, provide as much comments or as many comments as, as possible. What you shouldn't really do or avoid doing. Again, be, uh, submit the application very, very close to the uh, date where you want to have the training. Um, don't be too vague in your answers, okay? So again, be very concise and, uh, and, uh, and clear. Again, if you have any questions, we are always here to help you. You can contact us um, at eap at disn.org. We will always answer your questions. Uh, don't submit an incomplete application because we will go back to you and ask for the necessary attachments and necessary information. Uh, again, the, the budgets should be reasonable and very, very clear. Um, again, also, if uh, you are a nurse and if you want to apply, please bear in mind that the first visit should be led by the nephrologist. So this is something that you can work with your colleague nephrology, nephrologist. Again, focus on an academic program because don't focus on an academic program because we really want uh, this to be very um, hands on. Just some ideas. Regarding uh, the selection process, so we will have in mind the relevance and impact of the training as per local needs and goals and objectives of the training, so the, system, the sustainability of the, the project. We will also check the match between the needs and the training uh, presented and the, uh, the expert selected, the scope of the training, the involvement of other health professionals, 
as nurses, dietitians, technicians, etc., the relevance of the budget and the relevance of the training duration. Some examples of activities. So since 2009, more than 125 institutes in 56 countries have benefited from hands-on training by an educational ambassador. So these are just some uh, pictures of many of many of the uh, um, educational ambassador um, programs, activities that we've been having. Here are some examples of measurable outcomes from previous EAP. So in Balkis uh, Central Hospital, together with Ambassador Hamed Akel from the Urology and Nephrology Center in Manzura, they were able to create a new nephrology clinic and they were able to more efficiently handle AKI intensive care, care patients. In Myanmar, in January last, last year, uh, in the Yangon Children Hospital, together with Ambassador Ngar Kai Ui, <laughs> children from Children Kidney Center uh, National University from Hospital in Singapore, they were able to perform the first pediatric renal transplantation. So as you can see, we want this to have a real impact. But again, how to apply? Let's go into more details. So the applications are um, done via our uh, application website. How can you access it? You have a direct link, which is ea.disn.org, or you can also um, access it via our website, theisn.org. You can go to programs, uh, apply for ISN programs, and you have educational ambassadors, and you can click on that and you will enter our website. When you do so, you will see this uh, page, and in this page, you will be able to whether log in if you have already an account, and you will use your credentials to access it or then create a new account. So you'll have to click on the sign up button. So creating a new account, you will have to insert your details, confirm a password, and you will be uh, sent a confirmation email. So please check if you do receive that email, check the spam uh, inbox because it might end up there. So we will should, you should click that email to confirm and you'll be able then to access the application website. When you create the um, account, you will have access to this page in which if you have already an account will be, or if you have already created an, uh, an application or started an application, you will have access to it. You will see it, to, it will be listed here. If it is a new application that you want to create, you have the create new application uh, button and that's what you should uh, click. Uh, if you do have started or if you have started a new application, um, you can edit in the list and you can work from there. So when starting the creation of a new application, you should choose the category educational ambassadors host center and enter your first name, last name, city and country, because that's how your uh, application will be identified and then uh, click get started. So you will end up in this page where the fun is all about. Um, you will be able to have access to the multiple steps of the uh, application process. So you have different needs that need to be completed before being able to submit your application. You can see that uh, uh, in the beginning, all the status uh, or all the uh, status are incomplete, uh, but you can complete them at your own pace. So you do not, you do not have to complete them, all the tasks at once. You can start your application and then come back a few, year, a few days later and just uh, complete uh, the rest. So you'll be able to add your educational ambassador. Uh, here you can uh, insert first name, last name, email, 
And your educational ambassador will also receive a confirmation email. And by confirming that email, you will also be able to access the application and work on it together with you. And then the fun begins. So completing as detailed as possible your application form. Um, you note that is a key, it is a key, a key requirement to be an active ISN member, so that's why we ask for uh, your number. And then you have all sorts of uh, information that you should uh, fill in. You will be asked about the renal service information, uh, direct patient care involvement, the training request, the specifics of the training, the educational ambassador, the CV, the timing or duration of the visit, the budget, and of course, ending by uh, confirming adherence to the Declaration of Istanbul and signing your application. So once you complete all the steps, all the actions, uh, you will be able to see the progress bar and it will be at 100%. And you will also have available the button submit your application. Okay, it is only available once you complete all the steps, all the actions. So once uh, you submit your application, uh, it will be reviewed by the programs coordinator and then by the members of the committee, which are who are representatives from all the regions of the world. And finally, the chair will provide a final decision on, on, your, on your application outcome. Again, uh, if you ever encounter any technical problems or if you have any questions or if you don't know how to fill in or you, don't, or you aren't sure about the uh, information you should um, share, please get in touch with us. So we are always available at uh, eap at theisn.org and you, we're always here for your support. So thank you very much Mara. Thanks again uh, Vanessa and Vivek for your presentations. Very much appreciated, it's very insightful. Um, I think it's now time for questions and answers. Um, I see that I haven't received any question from the audience at the moment. So feel free to submit your questions through the question box and we will address them. Thanks, Sophie. I, I, this is Vivek here. I think it is uh, it is useful to point out that the uh, Education Ambassador Program guidelines are available in the handout pane. So Indeed. the PDF version of the guideline is available to any of you, and you can just click on download, click on that, so that it will be downloaded to your computer, and you can actually uh, you can go through that document, which which has a lot of that information, which Mara has just provided. So uh, can I just ask a question on behalf of the members, uh, Sophie and Mara? What is the typical turnaround time between an application and a response from the committee? Uh, so we will try to answer um, or give a, an outcome a feedback on the application as soon as possible, but perhaps in a maximum two to three weeks. So it's not that long right i mean you no, do provide not, of course the we we again once we receive a, an application we we will review it and the the moment we do if we do identify that any information is missing any attachment is missing we instantly get in contact with uh the organizer so this is a very fluid and we want to make it even more fluid uh, process Again, we're always available by email. I have a question here from uh, Rahil Hamet. He's asking whether a resident in nephrology can apply for uh, the Education Ambassador Program. I suppose he means whether a resident in nephrology can uh, be an Education Ambassador. Um, Vivek, could you take that answer? So, typically, uh, like I said, we do hope that the person who goes and as, as an ambassador has certain amount of expertise uh, which he or she can impart to uh, to a center. So uh, 
I don't know what you mean by a resident. If you mean by a person who is still in training, then perhaps that person will not be appropriate to be considered as an ambassador at that particular time, because generally they would not have had sufficient experience to be able to advise a new center in either refining its existing services or setting up a new service uh, as Dr. Vanessa Bijol described to you in the case of a pathology, but could equally be an uh, intervention pathology service or a transplant service. So we do expect that a, a potential ambassador has a, a fair amount of experience in, in his or her field of expertise. Okay, thank you very much, Vivek. Um, I see a hand raised uh, from Sushil Sagar. Uh, since there are not so many of us on the line, I suggest that we unmute you so that you can ask your question live. Would that be okay? So Sushil, feel free to ask your question. Oh, hi everybody. It was a beautiful presentation by all, uh, Vivek followed by others. It's very exciting. I'm looking forward to participate. I'm based in New York. I'm on the faculty, I'm professor of medicine, and uh, uh, me very close to actually the institution at Hofstra Northwell. So we will be able to have some direct dialogue with Vanessa at some point, I believe. Uh, my question is, how do we identify the host institute? Uh, it's a wide variety of ideas one has. And um, is there any guidance where the need is more than other places or we just go randomly to find a host institute so thank you dr sagar i think it's worth mentioning here dr dr dr, uh, dr. sagar was my attending when i was an intern in training uh, so good to hear from you dr sagar so uh, i the identification of a host institution is pretty much uh, a process which happens by uh, organically. So there could be institutions that really are interested in setting up programs and they would actively look out for a ambassador who can come and help them uh, set up that service. Uh, they might meet a potential ambassador at a conference or in, you know, by reading their papers or, or encountering them on one of the internet uh, services like YouTube, etc., and get in touch with them and invite them. And if the ambassador agrees, then they go ahead and apply. Uh, on the other hand, uh, sometimes uh, the education uh, expert, the ambassador, also through his or her own interest, identifies a potential area where there is a need and then gets in touch with uh, a, a local host uh, and, and proposes a program and they together develop a program of work and thereby come to an agreement and, and, and then apply for, uh, for such a program. So this usually happens organically. So if uh, you have, I, I know that you do uh, come to uh, India, for example, and, and work with a number of centers. So if you have uh, any uh, center where there is potential for setting up something like that uh, you can either ask them to uh, apply uh, either with you or with someone else as a potential ambassador or or you can identify such centers as well thank you very much there are a few other questions um one is from uh, arvin kanchi who's asking whether um, can we act as educational ambassadors if we could impart knowledge about how to use social media to improve nephrology education? So, uh, uh, again, uh, typically, Arvind, uh, thank you for your question. Typically, as uh, uh, Mara and Sophie mentioned, education ambassador program is set up to help improve services rather than education. Uh, by itself, uh, but I think if you can weave in uh, elements of education around some service and show how, uh, I, I'm not uh, singling out social media here, but it could be any type of education. There are many tools, pedagogical tools available these days, and uh, you know uh, they could be used to improve uh, service delivery as well as education. So education is not completely off the table because service delivery is also accompanied by uh, imparting education. So if you can actually uh, uh, make a, a compelling case around that, then certainly it is possible. Okay, 
Thank you very much. Another question is uh, whether there are any age limit to be an uh, to be an ambassador. I think the short answer is no. There is no age limit. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, there are other questions. I'm going through them. So I am a second year renal fellow and has and I have a strong interest uh, in general nephrology and renal pathology. Could I be a host for my institution? I think it depends on how your institution is set up. If uh, uh, you can, in application, show that uh, uh, you will be able to be part of a sustainable service, then certainly it can be considered. Because typically, uh, residents finish their training from that institution and then uh, go away. Uh, I don't mean go away in a bad way, but generally, uh, they would look for a permanent position elsewhere. Uh, in which case you may not be able to provide a sustainable platform for setting up a service. But uh, if there is a, a, if during your residency there is already a commitment that you will continue on in the same institution, and uh, if your hospital administration provides that kind of uh, uh, reassurance, then certainly you can be considered. Okay, thanks. Another one is um, what is the deadline for collecting applications? Uh, Mara, I think you can answer this one. Um, yes, uh, there is no deadline. Uh, you can apply all year round. Uh, we just, uh, like we said during our presentation, we would like to uh, have some time to analyze and to provide you the best support we can. So we, we ask you to uh, submit your application at least some months before uh, you want your training to start. But again, you can do that all year round, okay? So the as Mara said, the deadline is three months from the date of start of your program. Yeah, here is another question about how to find a host institute. The second question for interventional nephrology license. Of the, so, um, my question is how to find a host institute. The second question for interventional nephrology license of that uh, country required. So, I suppose here that there are as, do you mean as an ambassador you would like to find a host institution to go to? I suppose that would be the question, right? Uh, I, I think that in that case uh, we typically have a list of educational ambassadors uh, at the ISN and uh, we would then encourage those people to find by uh, within their network a host institution to, to, to which they, go, they could go to in order to provide a training uh, based on their uh, skills and capabilities. Um, Vivek, do you want to add anything on that? Oh, no, that's that's right. And I think I partly answered that question uh, when yeah. responding to Dr. Sagar that uh, it's generally a matter of curiosity uh, for a potential willing ambassador to uh, to sort of uh, go out and find out through his or her networks uh, where there is a potential match for uh, for their skills, and then you know th that way they can uh, develop a conversation with with a potential host center. Okay, and then I, I, sorry, a second, the a second point I think regarding the licensing is an important one because if you want to go and set up some service, then uh, it is always a good idea to find out what are the local licensing requirements, and there you should uh, actually work with the local host center to make sure that those requirements are met uh, and 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 local legal licensing etc. Uh, the ISN is not aware of the licensing requirements in every single country. So that information should be obtained from the local host center. Uh, but wherever uh, possible, the ISN will do its best to facilitate the process. OK. And there is a very last question from Sharza Osare. And she has actually asked, she's actually saying that um, she has a colleague who recently tried to become an ambassador, but uh, because uh, he was from Iran, he could not be an ambassador and he, he could not proceed. And here I just want to mention that this is uh, prob probably related to the fact that unfortunately ISN is, an, uh, is uh, registered in the USA, so we have to follow the US rules and that uh, there's an embargo on uh, Iran, so we cannot do anything we want in Iran. We uh, are struggling with that and we have applied for a general license in order to overcome that difficulty. And I'm pretty confident that we will be able to provide a, a better service to Iran very soon. 
Um, I think I don't see any more questions coming. Um, so I would say that we can close the webinar. I just want to deeply and warmly thank you, Vivek, Vanessa and Mara for your time and for your presentations and for the stories. I also want to thank all the attendees. As a reminder, this session has been recorded, so we will be able to access uh, the recording and you will be able to share it with your colleagues. Don't hesitate to get in touch with us should you wish to ask questions after the webinar. And we hope to see many new applications in the coming months. Thank you very much and goodbye, everybody. <laughs>